It was warm in Lutz Recital Hall that November evening. To make things more intimate, we set up chairs right on the stage so that the audience of mostly students could be as close to the performers as possible. While my throat <clears throat> felt slightly parched from not drinking enough water prior to the concert, the rest of me was feeling great. My hands were warmed up. The energy in the room was full and powerful. My ears were dialed in to the incredible musicians I was performing with, and I was feeling confident. That is, up until about the second chorus of the piece you just heard, Wayne Shorter's jazz classic, Yes and No. You see, we were a bit rushed before the concert, and we had to skip this one in practice. Now, even though this was our closing piece, we all felt like this was the easy one. It was the only one we didn't practice or talk through prior to the concert, but we were all professional, regularly performing musicians. This wasn't our first rodeo. And this wasn't just any recital. This was our Lebanon Valley College faculty jazz recital. We were the professors, and this wouldn't be a problem, right? Wrong. All was fine until I realized one chorus into that song that either I was looking at the wrong chart or I was missing some critical piece of information in the chart, maybe a repeat, a coda, or something. But one thing for me was very much clear. What I was seeing was not matching what I was hearing. At that point, my already parched throat tightened up, making it difficult to swallow. The already warm room became like a sauna. Sweat started to flow from my neck as I realized, yep, I was lost. I was lost in the song. But it was much too late. As you heard from the recording from that concert, the song was already flying along at full speed, and soon it would be my turn to take a solo. Now, as you may have picked up by now, I love starting my sermons with a story. Often I will use a funny or interesting story from my childhood, and growing up as a young musician provided me with a wealth of colorful stories to share. These stories serve several functions. They're attention-grabbing. They provide real-world illustrations of the sermon topic of the day. And selfishly for me, they also feel pretty safe. Even when, as they frequently do involve embarrassing moments, mistakes, or learning opportunities from my past, they're far enough in the past that they could fall in a category of just kind of fun or maybe even cute. But this, this was not one of those stories. This is a fresh one from good old 2019. And even though that does feel like a lifetime ago with all that's happened in the last couple of years, this event is still fresh in my mind as one of my most professionally embarrassing moments in recent years. While phrases like, no one's perfect, or we all make mistakes, are common, let's face it, none of us are very comfortable being seen in a less than perfect light, right? I mean, from our social media photos to the caricatures of ourselves that we bring to our jobs, social gatherings, and even church, most of us possess an innate desire to portray ourselves as as close to perfection as possible. Some of us struggle with perfectionism and perfectionistic tendencies. And I'm so grateful to our AV team that they put up with mine. Yet, in our Photoshop, Auto-Tune, Snapchat, Filter, social media, screen-cluttered world, we've come to expect perfection. We carry with us an often unconscious expectation for our musicians to deliver flawless performances, our movie stars to exhibit perfect faces and bodies, our infrastructure to flow perfectly, our doctors to deliver perfect, timely care, our leaders to make perfect decisions for the best interest of everyone, our jobs to treat us perfectly fair, and our church to provide perfect ministry. We also recognize the great social dichotomy that's so prevalent today. The idea that in our favorite books, TV shows, and movies, we love flawed heroes and redemption stories. Yet in real life, the cost of making mistakes feels greater than ever, and that cancel culture has made redemption for some mistakes seem impossible. As we look at magazine covers, big budget movies, and those flawless Instagram images, we know deep down inside that this observable perfection is achieved through the use of smoke, mirrors, lighting, cropping, filtering, and whatever other means necessary to portray perfection. But whether we admit it or not, 
Most of us also expect this same level of perfection, or at least the image of perfection from ourselves and maybe our families. We take multiple pictures so that we can decide which one to share, which one is the most perfect. For example, I'm hoping this this will work. Check out this picture uh, this Christmas of Amy and I meeting with Santa. It's a nice picture, right? Well, if you're wondering why Santa might be looking in another direction, here's the not cropped out version of this picture. So, the full picture tells a little bit of a different story. Now, I know a thing or two about cropping and filtering and and doing some things with video. As we know from uh, this pandemic, uh, some of the things that we've had to learn along the way were trying to create good production. So if you think about, uh, I think this might have been sometime last year, uh, we were doing a series on love, and our group recorded the song Sweet Love by Anita Baker. And here's a little clip from that, uh, just as a reminder. So I, I, I like that one because, number one, I thought it was a cool tune. It fit the theme well. Plus, I got to play the guitar. But here's one of my favorite uh, bloopers, I guess you could say, behind the scenes reels from that video shoot. <laughs> so, I, one of my favorites. We crop out the bad, we filter the unwanted, we clean up the rest, and we share it as high quality as possible, the most perfect version of ourselves we can. And you can't blame us, right? I mean, we all want to put our best foot forward. There's nothing wrong with that. But as the pandemic has shattered so much of what normal used to be, this area is also no exception. Increasingly through the pandemic, society becomes more real in naming the comedic farce that is this chasing of perfection. More and more of us are becoming increasingly comfortable putting it out there, keeping it real, sharing the real struggles in real life, and I love this. I love that many of us aren't afraid to show the uncropped and unfiltered images, the one where we admit all isn't perfect, that we're tired, we're scared, we're frustrated, we're struggling with whatever it is, mental health issues, addictions, toxic relationships, or even struggling with perfectionism itself. As we begin the new year, many of us are making and potentially already breaking some New Year's resolutions. And regardless of whether we are the resolution type or not, for most of us, the new year creates an opportunity to reflect on the past year, its ups and downs, and to look ahead. We do this personally, we also do this as a faith community. Where are we called in 2022? Who are we called to be? What ministries will we pursue? What is our path forward? How do we not just survive as the body of Christ, but thrive in 2022 and help others do the same? How can we be more welcoming and more inviting in 2022? How can we have a bigger impact on our community and in our world? Now, the harsh reality is the image of 2022 being the perfect year we hoped it would be has already been shattered. With COVID numbers higher than ever, it seems that this year is off to a less than perfect start. But did we really think it would be perfect? I mean, nothing's perfect, right? Except for God, of course. And as the biblical authors and Pythagoras, another mathematician, all viewed three as the perfect number, And as there's a common thought that the perfect sermon is a three-part sermon, I have three thoughts on perfection for us to ponder this morning. Ponderable perfection precepts, we could say. The first relates to our pursuit of perfection, and that is that we are not called to be perfect, but we are called to bring our personal best. We are not called to be perfect, but we are called to bring our personal best. Wait a minute. We should strive for perfection, right? I mean, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says, 
be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. But in Romans 3.23, Paul says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So, in the Sermon on the Mount, is Jesus really telling us to be perfect, giving us a challenge that we can't live up to? Biblical scholar Eugene Boring doesn't think so, and I'm inclined to agree. According to Boring, perfection, as described in the Gospel of Matthew, is not to be understood in the Greek sense of absolute moral perfection, certainly impossible for us humans to attain, but the word perfect in this case is better translated as wholeness. In this Matthew passage, to be perfect is to serve God wholeheartedly, bringing all of ourselves, bringing the best of ourselves to serve God and to serve neighbor. As the world adjusts its perspective from perfection to realistic expectations, a popular concept these days is that perfect is in fact a terrible goal to strive for anything because true perfection is unattainable. Instead of perfection, we should strive to bring the best of ourselves to our call of exemplifying Christ's love in the world. Oftentimes, especially in church culture, we feel like we need to be guaranteed absolute perfect success in any endeavor before we just go for it. And you've heard many times from leadership here about the dangers of analysis through, through paralysis, and many of you are intimately familiar with our well-intentioned tendencies to literally analyze something to death before actually taking action. So I don't really feel any more needs to be said there. However, I do believe perspective is important and that right up front, we realize that there are no perfect solutions. There are no perfect decisions and there are no perfect people. Yes, I did say that. I mean, as far as I know, none of us are perfect. We are human, we are flawed, we all sin and fall short, and that is why we need God and we need each other and we need to bring our personal best. While we've certainly faced our share of challenges over the last year, we have much to celebrate and to look forward to. As you heard, as a congregation, we raised $8,800 for the Nigeria Crisis Fund in December. We ended 2022 in a budget surplus with overall giving even higher than the previous year. And I'm just as excited as you are to welcome a dynamic, visionary, and super cool new pastor to the pastoral team. But here's the thing. I know we're tired. I know we're feeling overworked, underappreciated at times, and we are all dealing with a universal PTSD that we'll be unpacking as a society for years to come. Yet, our call to ministry is more present than ever. Our congregation, our community, and our world needs us to bring our personal best. But how do we do that, especially in the face of so many obstacles? And that leads us to point two. We are called to be relentlessly consistent. We are called to be relentlessly consistent. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, we read, Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Truly remarkable results come from consistent effort, from being what I like to call relentlessly consistent. As I've said before as a music teacher, the biggest indicator to me of how successful a student will be isn't talent, it's not natural ability, and it isn't even their ability to work hard. It's about how consistent they are, how they're able to consistently keep working, even and especially when things get difficult, in those times when things don't, don't go well, in those times when the work is hard. When working to accomplish truly remarkable things, I love the phrase, be consistently good rather than occasionally great. Think about this in relationships. If we treat someone poorly Monday through Saturday, but then we try to make up for it on Sunday by being over the top great to them, the relationship will never flourish. However, if we consistently do our best, bringing the best of ourselves every single day, that is how great relationships build over time. If we're trying to learn a new skill, play a sport, or learn a musical instrument, it's always better to just keep showing up and doing the work rather than just showing up when we feel like it, 
or showing up when we know we're going to have that perfect practice session or that perfect training session. Often, it's through our biggest challenges and greatest failures that we become the strongest. And that is what drives our greatest achievements. I feel like the term moderation sometimes gets confused with consistency. While holding things in balance is essential and moderation certainly has its place, we cannot expect extraordinary results through moderate effort. We also cannot expect extraordinary results from occasional great efforts or giving up when things become challenging. Extraordinary results come through relentless consistency. As a people and as a church, I believe this is our time to be relentlessly consistent in following Jesus' call. We need to keep showing up, even when and especially when we don't feel like it. We need to keep giving the best of ourselves in those times when we feel like we have nothing to give. Now, to be clear, I'm not suggesting that we simply give it our best and then give up. I'm suggesting we give it our best for that day, and then we get up and do it the next and the next. We keep showing up. We are relentlessly consistent. Point three, and what I would consider the most important point, God loves us. God loves us in all our imperfections. We are imperfectly perfect. We're human. We're not perfect, but God loves us anyway. God loves us in our perfect imperfections. God's love is unconditional, forever and ever present. God won't love us any more or any less because of how well we do at something. God's love doesn't depend on our performance, our accomplishments, or our strives for perfection. God loves us, all of us, because we are all God's children. God loves us no matter what we do. Now, that doesn't mean that God loves everything we do but rather that God's love is unconditional. In Romans, we read, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing, not even ourselves. As imperfect as we may see ourselves, we are created and loved by God, each and every one of us. Whatever mistakes we made, are making now, and will make, God loves us. God is there for us, and through God, we can do better. We just need to open ourselves to God's love, God's forgiveness, and God's call for our lives. God loves us in our imperfections. We are made by God, imperfectly perfect, and often through those flaws, mistakes, and imperfections can come some of the most unexpected and beautiful things. So back to that faculty recital. Local saxophone legend Tom Stroman was wrapping up a burning saxophone solo, and I knew it would be my turn next to take a solo. Now, I had a choice. I could either give in to fear and the enormous self-doubt I was feeling at the time and just pass on taking a solo altogether, owning an early defeat. I could turn down my volume and timidly try to just fake through a short solo, playing it as safe as I could and hoping no one would pick up on my disgrace, or I could sit up straight, take a deep breath, and tear into a keyboard solo with everything I had, knowing full well I was perfectly lost in the song. But I would give it the best of myself. And this is what I did. If I was going to go down, at least I was going to go down swinging in that blaze of glory. So the saxophone solo came to a close. All eyes were on me. And the next several minutes, I'm not really sure what happened. But I do remember pulling upon everything inside myself, everything in my arsenal as a jazz keyboardist to create something. When the song was over, I just wanted to find a hole and hide. I was so embarrassed. Not even really knowing what happened, I just assumed that whatever came out during that solo was prime evidence for my lack of perfection. In the moment, And after the concert, everyone was extremely complimentary. They were saying how awesome the concert was and how awesome my playing was, but I just figured everyone was being kind. And that that concert would be one of the great moments in Lebanon Valley College history as the fail of the decade. 
Months later, we received the audio recording of that concert. I downloaded it, but it took me at least another week or two to build up the courage to actually listen to it. But the strange thing was when I did, much to my own surprise, what came out in that several minute solo, it, it wasn't perfect, but it actually ended up being one of the proudest and coolest solos I think I have on recording. Now, I'm not gonna play the entire clip, but I will play a, a piece of it for you as we end the sermon. And one of my favorite parts that I didn't pick up on at the time, but you can hear one, of the, one or two of the other faculty members giving out a yell of approval. Now in jazz, the standing joke is there's never really a wrong note, but simply a wrong choice. And while I certainly may not ever win a Grammy Award for this performance, I'm proud that I did courageously bring the best of what I had that evening. Through relentlessly consistent practice, I had ideas and strategies to call upon, and that no matter how I played that evening, God's love would still be present, even through my perfect imperfections.